Welcome to Non-Local, a quantum computing podcast. I'm one of your hosts, William Slostra, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Vincent Russo and Henry Ewan. And today we're going to talk about the origin of the Merman Paris Magic Square. So we'll get into the Merman Paris Magic Square in a minute. But before we get into that, since this is our first episode, I thought we should say something about what this podcast is about. So we're all researchers in math and computer science, and our focus is on quantum information. So in this podcast, we want to bring you behind the scenes on quantum computing research and talk about some of our favorite ideas in the field in the way you might hear about them by maybe uh, hanging out at the bar at a quantum computing conference. Does that sound right to you guys? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, You know, this is exactly the kind of podcast that I would have wanted to listen to when I was a grad student. Yeah, sounds good. And I think it also might be worth mentioning that as far as the audience goes, this podcast is aimed at everyone from enthusiasts to experts. No matter what your level is, if you're interested in quantum computing and willing to Google things every once in a while, we hope that you can follow along and and get something out of every episode. I also want to add that the name of this podcast, Non-Local, comes from a subject that we've all worked on, uh, which is non-local games. Um, It's also a reference to the fact that we're all recording this from different locations. But despite the name, we're not just going to talk about non-local games in this podcast. Uh, We're also going to have guests later on to help us discuss all kinds of different topics. Right. But today, actually, it's just the three of us. And since it is our first episode, we thought we might as well talk about non-local games. And all three of us have worked on a particular game called the Merman Paris Magic Square, which is pretty well known in the field. But Vinny and Henry, you mentioned that you've uh, you've never read the original papers. That's right. Actually, before we even started planning this episode, I'd never even looked at them. So this whole episode is quite a treat for me personally. Same here. Well, that's great um, because I think they're amazing papers and I've got them here so we can look at them together today. They're great papers, but they're a little different from what you might expect. But before we get into the origin of the Merman Paris Magic Square game, uh, we should explain what the Magic Square game is. So, Vinny, you said you had an explanation prepared? Yeah, exactly. I've got something that I think I can put forward to our listeners. So, I think a lot of our listeners might remember the notion of a Magic Square, and they might actually be familiar with this from their grade school days. If you sat in math class, you may have been given a piece of paper that had a grid on it. So let's just say three rows and three columns. So basically your challenge as the student in this case is to find a suitable set of numbers that you can put into each of those cells such that every sum of every row in this three by three grid is equal to a given number and simultaneously the sum of every single column is equal to this magic number. So this is a magic square. It's kind of the magic square idea that you might already be familiar with. Now, There's a bit of a slight variation on this idea that is known as the Merman Paris magic square. And instead of enforcing that the sums of the rows and columns are equal to a given magic number, we instead enforce a parity constraint. A parity constraint means whether the number of the sum in this case is even or odd. So for Merman Paris square, we enforce that the sums of the rows, we want those to be even. And simultaneously, we want each of the columns to be assigned numbers such that each of the column sums are equal to an odd number. So this is the constraint that we are given for the Merman Paris magic square. And if you have some time, want to pause the podcast and preferably aren't driving, if you put down a piece of paper and try and populate a three by three grid with numbers to try and satisfy all of these constraints simultaneously, you'll probably find it's not possible to do so. So the closest that you're probably going to get is that you might find an assignment of numbers such that let's say all of your rows sum to an even number, but maybe only two out of the three columns actually satisfy the summing constraint of being equal to an odd number. You're going to have that one problematic or pesky column that is equal to an even number when it should actually be equal to an odd number. And try as you might to alter any of the entries in that column. If you do that, you're going to essentially propagate that issue somewhere else in the in the three by three grid. So no matter what you do, you're never ever going to be able to simultaneously satisfy all of the nine constraints. That is, the three rows need to sum to an even number and the three columns 
need to sum to an odd number. And so is it still okay to call it a magic square just with these parity constraints instead of asking that they actually sum to an actual number? I think the key distinction between magic square and Merman Paris magic square is precisely going from the number summing to a given magic number. And then the Merman Paris bit comes from the parity constraints on the rows and the columns. I guess it's worth mentioning that if you're familiar with modular arithmetic, so arithmetic mod two, that you can actually think of this as an actual magic square, but now all the entries are um, elements of Z2, and we're asking that the sum over the rows be zero mod two, and the sum over the columns be uh, one mod two. So then it is an actual magic square, just with Z2 arithmetic. So the numbers you put in each of the, the boxes will just be zero or one. That's right. Well, there'll be elements of Z2, which are, uh, I guess, uh, the equivalence class of zero or the equivalence class of one. Sure, if we wanted to get pedantic. Uh, and I think this is helpful to our listeners, but maybe not so helpful to the grade schoolers who are prescribed these types of things. Uh, it, it is helpful to make that distinction. And you're right. It really is just a magic square with kind of more pedantic constraints, as Henry pointed out. And what's kind of interesting about this setting is that while we can't prescribe any entries in this magic square, such that all the rows sum to even numbers and all the columns simultaneously sum to odd numbers, we're always going to have that one column or row out of place. If we make use of a resource, which I'm sure is probably not anything out of the scope for our listeners, or maybe they're just stumbling on this concept for the first time, but they can leverage quantum entanglement, which is a resource that we can actually use to satisfy this constraint across all of the rows and all of the columns. So we can make use of quantum entanglement to actually do strictly better than we could have done if we were to just make use of classical resources. That is resources that don't make use of this notion of quantum entanglement. And I think a good way for us to phrase this that I think is going to be helpful for the rest of the podcast that is gonna come up with some of the topics that William and Henry are gonna talk about is to frame the setting in the context of a game. And terminology some of our listeners might already be familiar with is the terminology of a non-local game. So in this game, you have two players that we're gonna call prototypically Alice and Bob. And we're gonna assume that Alice and Bob are in separate rooms or spatially separated in a way that Alice can't talk to Bob and vice versa. And Alice is going to be given a question, as is Bob, and they're going to be given questions from this third party known as a referee. So this referee is going to give Alice one of the three rows of this magic square, of this Mermaid Paris magic square, and likewise Bob is going to get a column, one of the three columns from this square. So what is going to happen here is Alice is going to get her row, and she needs to populate that row with a set of integers such that the sum of that row is even. And Bob is going to do something very similar where the sum of his entries in his column that he is given need to sum to an odd integer. And just to reiterate, Alice and Bob are spatially separated. So Alice does not know the column that Bob got. And likewise, Bob does not know the row that Alice got. And there's a bit of an added constraint here as well. So the added row to be equal to an even number and adding up the entries in the column to be equal to an odd number sounds familiar based on the setting that we described before. But an added constraint here is that the cell that overlaps with the row in the column, you can imagine a three by three grid, there's always gonna be one cell that overlaps between any row and any column. That one cell, we enforce that that needs to be of equal parity. So, if Alice puts down an even number in that cell that overlaps with Bob's column, we enforce that Bob also needs to make sure that he puts down an even number in that cell. And the same concept is true if Alice puts down an odd number there as well. And the tricky part here is Alice doesn't know the column that Bob got, nor does Bob know the row that Alice received. And so they want to satisfy all of these constraints simultaneously, these are known as kind of the rules of the game in this case. So we already know that it's not possible for Alice and Bob to simultaneously satisfy all of these constraints simultaneously. There's always going to be one that is uh, not going to be satisfied. So we say that classically, if Alice and Bob use a classical strategy in this game, uh, 
the best they can do is win with probability eight nights. There's three rows, three columns, nine possible uh, question pairs that they can get. We say that they can win at best with eight nights probability if they use a classical strategy. So just to clarify, when you're talking about classical strategies, this refers to when Alice and Bob are behaving according to uh, classical physics, right? Exactly. They're not invoking anything quantum. They're performing their strategies in a completely deterministic way. They could involve some probabilistic elements to their strategies, but it wouldn't necessarily help them at all. So all the resources they're using to perform their strategy in the game has nothing to do with quantum information or entanglement or anything. But it turns out that if Alice and Bob, as was alluded to before, make use of an entangled strategy, that is one that uses a shared quantum state and sets of measurements, they can actually win this game, the Merman Paris Square, they can win it perfectly. And they can only do this in the context of using a quantum strategy. They can't do this classically at all. And I think the most striking thing about this is that we showcase a given task that can be done strictly better when the players make use of entanglement, which is a resource that is specifically unique to quantum information. So, and the amazing part about it is that the game is so simple. I think that's the beauty of it. I often find that um, people ask me to explain what entanglement is, and they always want some kind of one-line explanation that really reveals a secret to uh, what entanglement is, which is really hard to give. And it's it's easy to give explanations that like somehow miss the mark by a little bit or are inaccurate in some way. I always feel like the, the nice thing about non-local games is you can say that this is kind of what entanglement is. It's a thing that allows you to win games like this um, perfectly where you couldn't with classical resources. It's almost, in a way, the, the best accurate description of what entanglement is that, um, that's short. Yeah, and uh, it grounds it in something that people feel like they can understand, you know, the simple three-by-three three grid, filling it out with even and odd numbers, um, as opposed to, you know, popular science uh, accounts where they say, oh, quantum entanglement allows you to communicate instantaneously, but not really. And there's spooky correlations. Like, what does that mean? I really like this, actually. And and so I, I'll just say that my, my advisor was John Watrous, and he has a textbook where the introduction of this textbook, he says things like, the Schrodinger equation is blissfully ignored throughout the course of this textbook. And there's kind of a beauty and simplicity to that in the sense that you're just kind of assuming the mathematical uh, capabilities of these sorts of things as kind of a given, and you're not necessarily getting lost in some of the more nuanced features of what entanglement is. You're just kind of encapsulating and assuming some of those mathematical properties in uh, kind of what you think about and what you do. And while maybe some physicists might have some problems with that interpretation, they might see uh, like my view of that a little bit simplistic and fair enough. I mean, I'm not a physicist and there's a lot of blind spots that I have and, you know, my apologies, but I, I will say that I really enjoy that formulation. So where did the Merman Perez Magic Square game come from? Well, as you might expect from the name, the Merman Perez Magic Square game comes from two papers, one due to Perez and one due to Merman. Uh, I should say Asher Perez and David Merman. Both of these papers came out in uh, December of 1990, the Paris paper, I think on December 3rd and the Merman paper on, uh, December 31st. And the Paris paper was in physics letters a, and was titled, uh, incompatible results of quantum measurement. The Merman paper was published in physical review letters and was titled, uh, a simple unified form for the major no hidden variable serums. Now, what was in these papers? Well, the papers were influenced by what Paris calls various quantum paradoxes that were known at the time, which was uh, the EPR paradox and Bell inequalities, and most of all, the koch specker theorem. So what the koch specker theorem says is that we can't assign definite values to observable quantities. Observable quantities in quantum mechanics are things that we can measure or observe, like maybe the mass of an object is something that we could, uh, we could measure. And when we talk about assigning definite values to observable quantities, we're referring to something like saying that the, the mass of an object is 10 kilograms. That would be a, a definite value for that observable quantity. Now, it's an important postulate of quantum mechanics that we, we can't actually assign definite values to observable quantities. We actually learn about this postulate when we first learn about quantum mechanics. Um, it's kind of just taken for granted 
So it's basically the fact that when we're talking about the state of a system, we don't just write down mass equals 10 as part of the state. We have to write down um, a unit vector. And when we talk about measurements, we, we can't write down, oh, look up the value of that variable mass and, and just see what it is. We have to write down a measurement operator. So it's implicit in those properties of quantum mechanics that we can't write down definite values to observable quantities. So we should point out that this is more mysterious than saying that the um, properties of a system are probabilistic, right? Right. I mean, it's a lot more complicated to write down a matrix and a vector rather than just having to write down, let's say, a probability distribution that says, uh, you know, we get this with probability a half and this with probability a half. So uh, it is a, a lot more complicated than saying we can just write down a probabilistic um, explanation. But if this is an important postulate of quantum mechanics, what does the Koch and Specker theorem say? Well, I'd like to, uh, to quote from Merman's paper here because it gives you First of all, a, a really nice uh, explanation of what the point is, and second of all, a little, um, a little bit of the flavor of Merman's paper. So he says, the point of the Koch and Specker theorem is to extract this, the fact that we can't assign definite values to observable quantities, directly from the quantum mechanical formalism, rather than merely appealing to the precepts enunciated by the founders. So what he means by that is that there's something that can happen in quantum mechanics, or which is uh, predicted to happen in quantum mechanics, which couldn't happen if we could assign definite values to observable quantities. Now, looking back on it, the amazing part, I think, uh, to both Merman and to, uh, to me, is that the Koch and Specker theorem is really complicated. It uses 117 different observables. So the idea is that there's, a, there's something that can happen if you have 117 different observable quantities in quantum mechanics, which would not happen if you could assign definite values to all those observable quantities. And Merman says that to the well-trained quantum mechanician, it must surely seem shocking that the direct refutation of so heretical an attempt should require so elaborate a counterexample, but that is where things have stood for almost 25 years. So the Koch and Specker theorem came out in, uh, in 1967. This paper is being written in, uh, in 1990, so that's almost 25 years. And what he means by uh, heretical an attempt is uh, attempts to assign definite values to observables. I just want to say that I really enjoy the term quantum mechanician. I don't know why it's not more widely used, and uh, it's it's just I just wanted to point that out. I can imagine holding up a business card, you know, Vincent Russo, quantum mechanician. You know, call me at one eight hundred quantum. It would of course be a one eight hundred number as well. I mean, that's just I, I really love that. I think I'm going to have to steal that from uh, David Merman. So that's that's a really interesting account. Uh, I love that quote. Uh, is it Seth Lloyd who calls himself a quantum mechanic? Well, he, yeah, that's right. He's, I think he's part of the mechanical engineering department. So uh, he always likes to clarify that he's a, a quantum mechanic. I'll just maybe uh, kind of short circuit all that and just put quantum mechanician on my business card and see where that's get, that gets me in terms of job prospects. Probably not very far. So just to uh, make sure I understand this, the Koch and Specker theorem. So I guess it's a theorem, meaning that it's, it's you, because you earlier you said it was a postulative of quantum mechanics, but you can derive it from from the basic principles of quantum information, right? Right. When we start using unit vectors and measurement operators all over the place, we're basically assuming that it's all worth it to use those things, that we really have to use them in, in for some reason. But what Merman's pointing out is that, hey, maybe in all the experiments that we do, there would always be some explanation where we could just assign definite values to observables and, and not go to all this trouble of, of using... Uh, uh, unit vectors and measurement operators. So what the Koch and Specker theorem um, implies is that there are things that can happen in quantum mechanics, which we couldn't explain if we did assign definite values to observables. Uh, I should qualify that by saying, without going to a lot of trouble mathematically, as in uh, Bohmian mechanics. So assigning unit vectors to things is really the, the neatest and simplest way of doing things. That's consistent with what quantum physics predicts. That we found so far, I think. There are people who would disagree, but um, I think it's not a particularly controversial statement. So if that's the Koch and Specker theorem, uh, what were Perrys and Merman trying to do? Well, what they were trying to do is to simplify this theorem. And they weren't the only ones. So right around that time, there was a, an attempt to try and find simpler versions of this theorem. And Perrys was also trying to kind of find a simpler form of the... Uh, the Koch and Specker theorem. So he came up with kind of a, a state-dependent proof of the Koch and Specker theorem that used, um, rather than 117 operators, just six operators. And so what Merman does in his paper is he takes these six operators from Perry's paper and says, hey, 
if we think about these as the, um, the first two rows of a square, we can add another three operators to get nine operators in total and make what's called a state independent proof of the Koch and Specker theorem. So I should explain um, how the Merman Paris magic square actually does prove the Koch and Specker theorem, which uh, we're describing as saying that you can't assign definite values to observables. So the idea is imagine a system which is a, a three by three grid where the values of the grid are set but not visible to you, and you can look at the values, make measurements to, uh, to look at the values. And the system is such that you can measure any row or any column at any given time, but um, you can't look at all the entries at once. That isn't allowed. So you can, you can look at all the entries in a given row or all the entries in a given column, but, um, but no more than that. And so because it's not possible to fill out all the entries with um, even and odd numbers, such that the sum of the, over the rows is uh, even and the sum over the columns is odd, you might think that um, that there's no way to make an assignment such that whenever you you come in and pop open a row or pop open a column and look at all the values, that you're always going to see um, all the entries being set to zero or all the entries being set to one. Because when the system is set up, the system doesn't know what row or column you're gonna, me uh, gonna measure. But what we can see in quantum mechanics is that it is possible to set up a system um, where this can happen, where you come in and you measure a row or a column and you find that when, no matter what row or column you measure, and remember the, uh, the system doesn't know it's been set up ahead of time and it doesn't know what measurement you're gonna do on it. It doesn't know whether you're gonna measure a row or a column, uh, but you come in and you measure it and it seems like it does know. No matter what row or column you measure, if you measure a column, the, uh, the entries in it sum to an odd number. And if you measure a row, the entries in it sum to an even number. And so this property, nowadays we call this uh, contextuality. The idea is that somehow uh, the measurements know whether they're being measured in the context of a row or a column and can kind of uh, fudge the numbers to, uh, um, to get the desired outcome. That's not what's actually happening. Uh, you know, it's really more the properties of quantum mechanics that allows uh, a system like this to exist. But the idea is that it looks like, to us, the outside observer, like the, uh, like the system knows what context we're measuring each cell in. Right. So that really justifies the name of a magic square. It's like you, you walked in this room and it's some kind of like magic trick where uh, this, this three by three square somehow knew, you know, what part of the square you want to look at. Right. I think in the, uh, the term magic square, that the magic part originally refers to the fact that you can satisfy these constraints and have them all add up to. Uh, the numbers that you were looking for. But here we have what people like to call, um, sometimes also referred to as magic, this property um, that you can actually do this thing that you couldn't do just by writing in the numbers uh, using quantum measurements. I actually really love David Merman's simplification here. And one of the first books I think I got into when I was getting into quantum information was David Merman's quantum computing for computer scientists or something along those lines. I apologize if I'm getting the name right, so we'll correct that in the show notes. But I think David Merman has a really uh, particular skill for just taking very complicated subjects like the one that you just outlined there and kind of conceptualizing them in a way that that removes a lot of the excess complexity and makes them kind of just very beautifully simple. Uh, this is part of a selfish reason is why I'm actually really enjoying this podcast. Yeah, and that's one of the things I really like about these papers. Um, you know, if you're a student uh, and you learn about a big concept like the Merman Paris Magic Square, which is, you know, pretty pretty well known nowadays, you might think, well, this must have been announced in some big paper. But actually, these papers, they're, uh, they're very short. So I didn't mention this before, but um, they're just a couple pages. So Paris paper is actually, um, I think, a, a page and a half. And Merman's paper is, uh, let's see, one, two, so three and a half pages, including the references and, and end notes. You just don't see cute little papers like that anymore. And I kind of, I, I miss those days when you see papers like that that were short to the point, sweet, but also really had a lot of very powerful ideas in them. And, and I really appreciate it. I mean, I'm beginning to appreciate that about some of these papers, which I haven't really delved into. And uh, again, using this podcast as kind of a window into those papers is really a treat for me. Yeah, and that's the other thing about these papers is they don't present themselves as having really big ideas in them. They're just uh, what we would call incremental papers. They're trying to take small steps and improve a, what they thought of as a 
you know, a really big idea, the Koch and Specker theorem. Um, and, and, you know, they're trying to improve it from 117 operators down to uh, six operators or nine operators. I guess that's one of those things where you realize it was uh, an important leap forward um, many years after the fact. Yeah, when you start to see the simplicity of the idea, then you really say, oh, well, they really had something with that. Um, and, and that seems to happen a lot. Like uh, you come up with something, it's just a, a simplification. Um, maybe people aren't that excited about it, but over time, you know, it becomes a, a really handy way of thinking about things. Uh, ideas like that are, are really important. Perhaps it's cliche, but hindsight is twenty twenty. Before we finish talking about these papers, I want to mention one more thing that I really like about Merman's paper, and that is that it's wrong about something. Now, that might seem like a weird thing to say if you're coming at this from outside of research. Even if you are a researcher, this might be a foreign idea. So why would I say I like that it's wrong about something? Well, um, it's kind of hard to put into words. I mean, the point is that when we're doing research, a lot of the times we are wrong about things. We have uh, an incomplete understanding and we're working towards a better understanding of the idea in our paper. The papers are written for people to come along and build on top of that and hopefully, uh, you know, move past or, or get a better understanding of the things we're struggling with. So it's nice to see a paper that was wrong about something and then was later, uh, we had an improved understanding. Sometimes you can imagine that uh, maybe the most interesting contribution of a paper is something that it's wrong about, uh, especially if it uh, encourages or uh, motivates uh, other people to uh, try to really uh, drill in and figure out uh, whether something is correct or uh, what's missing or what's wrong. Um, in fact, maybe a really good example of this is the original EPR paper uh, from Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Uh, they were the ones who said, hey, this quantum stuff is really weird. Um, there's no way that this can work. Uh, let's try to come up with a, a, a better classical theory of it. Uh, and that's what launched the whole Bell's theorem and Koch and Specker and, and so on. Something that maybe people who are not researchers don't understand the importance of maybe uh, putting out a best first guess and trying to kind of establish some point of territory. Um, the EPR paper is, as Henry mentioned, just absolutely foundational to so much of what we know about quantum information. Um, and so these sorts of attempts towards, you know, finding, so to speak, the uh, what the shadows represent on the cave wall, <laughs> what they actually mean uh, is part of science. That was very poetic. Yeah, and the whole point of the EPR paper was basically to say that quantum mechanics is flawed, and yet we use it as a kind of a, the starting point for so much of the things we're trying to do in quantum mechanics that have come later. So I think that's a really good way of putting it. So anyways, what, what's the thing that's wrong with the Merman paper? Well, it's not a, a mistake in a theorem or any kind of mathematical mistake. Instead, it's the idea that the merman perez magic square can't be turned into a game. But we already know from Vinny's explanation that that's not correct. So the fact that we can turn the magic square um, into a game comes from a later paper due to our event. So that paper was titled uh, A Simple Demonstration of Bell's Serum Involving Two Observers and No Probabilities or Inequalities, which was published on the archive in 2002. And it was actually an earlier paper of our event from 1999 that coined the term magic square um, in reference to. Merman and Perez uh, proof of the Koch and Specker theorem. So this paper was titled uh, Impossible Colorings and Bell Serum. Maybe a somewhat innocuous title for something that I think hits on a much bigger idea. Yeah, people have tended to gloss over the Aravind paper because now it's, uh, it's really obvious to us that things like this merman Paris magic square can be cast in, um, in the form of a game. And so it's interesting how these little ideas just kind of build on each other. And at the end, we have a, a really... I think a, a nice understanding of the subject that's due to so many people along the way, but it may have taken years um, to to get that viewpoint and to develop that viewpoint. Well, as the saying goes, I think we're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Or a lot of ordinary people all squished together. <laughs> that's the beauty of science. So that's where the Merman Paris Magic Square came from. To finish our episode, we should say a little bit about why is the Merman Paris Magic Square so well known today? What do we use it for? Yeah, so you know, why do we talk about this game so much today? Um, well, it turns out that this game has really useful and practical applications in quantum computing, in fact. And I'll describe one of these uh, applications today. One of my favorite uses of the Magic Square game is to get uh, something called certified quantum random numbers. Uh, 
Um, so let's imagine for a moment that uh, we didn't know anything about quantum physics. Like maybe we don't believe in it or we don't understand it. Uh, so we only know about classical physics. Okay. Uh, and we just heard that, you know, if Alice and Bob uh, only use strategies from classical physics, they can't win this magic square game better than uh, eight ninths of the time. Right. So any strategy for playing this game that does better than eight ninths obviously can't be classical. Um, but we can actually say something a little more than this. Um, for one, uh, suppose you know you had some uh, experimental setup uh, where you have Alice and Bob, right? They're, they're pieces of lab equipment that are separated from each other, and you're playing this game in the real world, and you see that Alice and Bob are winning this magic square game 100% of the time, consistently. So what can you say about uh, the outcomes of this experiment, right? Uh, these lab equipments are producing these numbers that sum up to even or odd, depending on you know uh, whether you're giving them a row or a column. Um, so not only are Alice and Bob generating these numbers uh, in a non-classical way, uh, they actually have to contain entropy. So in other words, their answers uh, are unpredictable. Uh, and in fact, uh, they can't be predicted by anybody else in the universe. Even the players themselves couldn't have predicted these answers ahead of time. So interdimensional travelers could uh, could potentially still predict it. Yeah. So uh, if uh, people can you know tunnel through space and time faster than the speed of light, uh, then uh, all bets are off. Uh, but I'm assuming here that Alice and Bob uh, are separated from each other. They can't communicate, uh, just like in the assumptions of the Magic Square game that uh, Vinny described uh, earlier in this episode. So comic book writers take note. And my job title as quantum mechanician is at jeopardy here, so I will hope that that assumption is true. Definitely, if you know, if we assume that Alice and Bob can't signal to each other faster than the speed of light, then we get a lot of mileage out of this. So I just said that their uh, answers uh, have to contain entropy; they're unpredictable, and this is a, a super wild thing. So it's you know, by playing this game, you can actually certify the generation of new randomness. Uh, in the physical world. And like I said, this is without knowing anything about quantum physics. So you can be uh, an adherent to classical physics uh, through and through, uh, but by running this experiment, you cannot deny uh, the existence of entropy uh, that's been generated by this uh, experimental process. And this is a super wild consequence, uh, in my opinion. It's it's putting Bell's theorem, uh, this magic square game in in much more visceral down-to-earth terms. So is this just something you uh, observe on paper? So here's what I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying that suppose someone handed you some lab equipment, right? And you don't know anything about how this lab equipment works. But what you do know is that the part of the lab equipment called Alice and the part of the equipment called Bob can't signal to each other faster than the speed of light. But you don't know anything more than this. You run this experiment uh, and you're seeing these numbers come out. And if these numbers correspond to winning the magic square game 100% of the time, like they're just always winning, then you have this guarantee mathematically that the, uh, the numbers produced by the lab equipment must be random. So it's, it's something that you know, occurs not just on paper, but this is something that you're seeing on real, in real life. But you're just describing a thought experiment, right? Does anybody actually do this? Good question. So it's not just a cool thought exercise. Um, people are actually taking advantage of what I just described uh, to produce certifiable randomness. So let me tell you about a, a really big example of this, which comes from NIST, which stands for the United States National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, they're the institution that uh, tells you uh, the definition of what a kilogram is uh, in, in the States. So what NIST has done is that they've set up a continuously running piece of equipment that's playing many, many iterations of a non-local game uh, that's very similar to the Magic Square. It's not exactly like Magic Square. And they're playing this game many, many times, and they're publishing the outputs of this game with some post-processing on the internet. And they call this their randomness beacon. So if Alice and Bob in this experiment are consistently winning the game each time, then their outputs are indisputably random. Okay, so what is this used for? Uh, well, the idea is that it's supposed to be used as a trusted source of randomness uh, that could be used uh, by the public. Uh, 
So maybe if you want to run a lottery uh, and you want to uh, guarantee that the uh, outcomes of your lottery are fair and, and not uh, you know, rigged, uh, then you can use the randomness that's coming from this randomness beacon. Or maybe you want to conduct, let's say, a, a random audit, or you somehow want to choose, uh, let's say, random judges for court cases. Uh, these are actually uh, applications that are uh, suggested by NIST. Uh, they say, well, maybe you can use the randomness beacon uh, uh, to give some you know, public verifiability uh, into your random process. But is it actually publicly verifiable, like, uh, or do we just have to trust them? Good. So the point is that, uh, yes, you do have to trust that NIST is really running this experiment and they've set up their equipment uh, in a uh, you know sound way. Um, of course, uh, if you don't trust the government and you know maybe there are uh, a bunch of people out there who don't, um, you know, for all you know, they could just be uh, cooking up numbers, um, you know, any way, which way. But if you trust the part of the government that is NIST. Uh, then the guarantee that you have is that these numbers that you're pulling off from the randomness beacon is random uh, based on the laws of physics. So just to quote you there, so you're taking the position that um, the government could be cooking up these numbers, I believe is what you said. <laughs> that That is totally off the record. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody actually use these things now for, like, do people actually, do people actually need certified randomness? Like, my impression is that so far people have been pretty happy with uh, Pseudo random number generators. Actually, I would say that people haven't been so happy with pseudo random number generators. Uh, there's been a couple of high profile incidents where uh, flawed or uh, compromised pseudo random number generators uh, have led to uh, weaker crypto systems um, or disputed uh, results. Even something as uh, commonplace as using random numbers uh, to uh, generate secret keys for online transactions and online communications. Um, when the random number generation process is compromised, this is actually allowed to uh, uh, security compromises. So people nowadays are increasingly looking for uh, sources of randomness that are uh, have more of a security guarantee. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I guess going forward, these things are going to become more and more important. So it'll be interesting to see if um, if this becomes something that uh, people want to actually use practically or not. I guess if if they do, they've got uh, NIST is is ready to go. And they're not the only ones who have this set up, right? Right. I think actually the another one of the goals of this uh, randomness beacon is not just to provide a source of randomness, but also to motivate other organizations and other governments to set up their own randomness beacons. Uh, so I, uh, if, as far as I understand, I think uh, there are other randomness beacons like one in Brazil and uh, in other places around the world. And if you're um, if you're actually the one running the randomness beacon, making the measurements so you can guarantee that they're being made um, in uh, kind of in spatially separated locations, then you don't have to trust the software or the hardware that you're being presented with at all, right? Uh, you actually can then certify. So a government could certify for itself that it was generating random numbers without having to rely on the fact that maybe the uh, the hardware is made in a different country. Oh yeah, that's a super good point. So uh, another really attractive feature is that let's say um, some country which maybe um, doesn't have uh, as good of a uh, engineering uh, manufacturing capacity, uh, they could buy these uh, this lab equipment from, say, you know, U.S. or even you know a place like North Korea. Play this magic square game uh, and still certify that the outcomes are genuinely random. And even the the designers of this lab equipment would have no idea uh, what this uh, what these random numbers are. Yeah, I was thinking even uh, for a country like Canada, that would be helpful. I mean. There's very few countries in the world that make all their own electronics equipment. So actually, a potentially important use case of certified random numbers uh, going forward in the future uh, could be blockchain. Not to throw yet another really popular buzzword onto this podcast, um, but uh, there's uh, a bunch of blockchain uh, companies uh, that have set up. And a lot of times when they get set up, there is a phase where uh, they have to uh, generate trusted randomness in some distributed way to set up the secret keys for the blockchain. You can imagine that um, you would want uh, you know, a blockchain that maybe involves you know, lots, you know, huge amounts of money to be um, secured in, in a more rigorous way. So maybe you can imagine blockchain that's certified by, these, uh, uh, you know, by the laws of quantum physics. 
So all this is really interesting. I mean, I think for all of us, we're most interested, especially in this podcast, in talking about the kind of ideas that lie behind uh, quantum computing and quantum information. But there's a lot out there now where you can actually follow the development of quantum technologies and watch as people try and take these ideas into the uh, into real applications. Um, so this will be an interesting one to keep an eye on. For sure. So this is uh, just a sneak preview of some of the cool ways that people have been trying to use non-local games like the Magic Square game. Um, you know, maybe this is uh, material for a, another podcast episode, um, but people have also used uh, the Magic Square game for things like verifying not just randomness generation, but also full-fledged quantum computations. But it's uh, quite cool to see how, you know, such a humble idea starting from these uh, three-page papers from the 90s from Merman Perez uh, have evolved to become actually used in uh, something that's useful for the real world, you know, including this uh, randomness generation. Well, we should be careful with that because uh, I think it's not, it's not the Magic Square game that's used in, in that uh, randomness beacon, right? Um, but what game is it? The game that they use is the CHSH game. So that's something we should just do another episode on. That's true. So um, I think as we mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk about some of our favorite ideas that we've encountered in our research. And we're also going to bring in, uh, in guests in later episodes to talk about some of their favorite ideas. And I hope we can find some guests that are kind of willing to talk about um, how they see you know, these ideas being implemented in the real world. Um, it'll be really interesting to hear that perspective. Personally, from my own perspective, I'm very much looking forward to chatting with them. Yeah, so we should wrap it up today. So uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks again for joining, everyone. Really appreciate going into the Merman Paris papers and all of the residual results in depth. It's been really fun. I'm looking forward to many more podcasts in the future. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll tune in again. Bye for now.